So thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. And before I start my presentation, I just want to, to thank the Hilsi and Elliot that is sitting in front of here for the nice and uh, kind uh, invitation. I mean, I always wanted to attend this meeting. This is my first time. So when I received the invitation, actually, I was very pleased because, you know, it was like a kind of desire that become, becomes true. But then I saw the title of the session, I mean, Zero Tolerance, and coming from Europe, where we actually have limits, you know, it was a little bit, uh, I don't know, let's say, impacting. Uh, and then, of course, when I went to the proposed title, I felt a little bit more confident because whole genome sequencing is in the area uh, where we are actually working, not directly, but uh, trying at least to implement some of the informations that we get from the whole genome sequencing to make our foods more safe. So today, I'm going to, to show you some, uh, some views, some work that has been done that is actually very promising towards the, um, the use of these approaches in order to improve safety of foods. And then I'm going to give you some perspectives. I mean, uh, probably at the end of the session, uh, you will go out with more questions than answers. Uh, but it's my role to do that because I think that we need to be in a position to uh, understand what are the possibilities that new methodologies that can give us. And so we don't have to give up because probably the scenario is too complex at this moment. Okay? So, uh, of course, I believe that everybody in this room, when he attended a session on whole genome sequencing, genome sequencing, uh, saw a graph like that. I couldn't resist not to put it, really, uh, because this is really putting into the context the sequencing uh, capabilities and the exploitation of these methodologies. So as you can see, practically the cost of sequencing has reduced a huge, uh, has a huge jump, a huge decrease. And if you take into consideration, for instance, right now, I mean, I was a couple of days ago in my room trying to shape the presentation. I would not say to prepare it, but to shape the presentation. I just, I just did the search, and as you can see, there is a huge amount of information for specific organisms that are, you know, the, the very known ones. But you can see that there is also some kind of increase in terms of uh, um, microorganisms that are becoming really relevant by the point of view of food safety. For instance, you have already 47 genomes for Arcobacter. Of course, uh, Listeria, Salmonella, Campylobacter are very well-known uh, football pathogens. So there is an interest from scientists to look into it. And then if you just plot the number of the sequences in the last uh, 20 years or 15 years, you can see that the huge increase has actually uh, uh, took place when the cost of the sequencing was reduced. So as if, you know, food scientists, in any case, they started to approach this methodology when the cost was very, was very low. And of course, this is absolutely uh, understandable and reasonable. But the, the other thing is that we have also a very uh, high speed of sequencing. So if you take into consideration the speed of sequencing considering the kilobase per day, you can see that practically in the last, in the last five years, we have uh, experienced what is called the third, third generation sequencing area in which you can start to go for very large uh, pieces of DNA to be sequenced. I mean, there are different technologies. Uh, probably the one that is the most exciting at the moment is this uh, mini ion Oxford nanopore that uh, exploiting nanopore technology. You can actually have portable devices that uh, after a 15 minutes preparation of the sample, you can get your sequences right away on the spot without having to transfer samples from fields to lab uh, with all the problems that we know. So we are really in an exciting um, uh, moment, in an exciting scenario. However, I see a high risk, and this is something that we start to take into consideration that we are going to get overloaded with uh, sequencing data. So we became very good in technology by the point of view of for the sequencing. 
we start to become good in terms of uh, uh, handling the data, the next challenge, I think, is going to be how we are going to translate the outcomes from the, gene, from the sequencing to the real world. Because I'm a food microbiologist, so I want to see things applied. So if we have uh, 1 million sequences or 10 million sequences of Allosteria monocytogenes uh, available, but we don't have a clear message to send to the food producers, then I think that we have a problem. So, uh, my role today is to take into consideration how uh, next, genome, next generation sequencing, or sorry, world genome sequencing is actually going to, uh, to improve or to impact on the risk assessments and, and, and regulations. Um, as I'm going to show you a little bit later, uh, we have had in Europe a workshop where we try to explore, we try to discuss or to start a discussion on how these methodologies could be integrated into microbiology risk assessment, microbiological risk assessment. This is a first paper that has been uh, produced by the working group um, dealing with uh, whole genome sequencing and the meta outcomes of uh, this group were that uh, micro, the, the whole genome sequencing can really uh, give you a nice insight on foodborne pathogen surveillance. Uh, can be used for understanding reservoirs and delineating transmission routes. This is something uh, already uh, said. But of course, you have also a very good possibility in contributions to the risk assessment and upgrading the hazard identification. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to, to go through these three points a little bit, just give you some insight. Of course, there are not uh, inclusive insights because the, the examples that you can find in the literature are, um, are huge in a sense that there is a, a large number of papers that have been already published on this specific subject. Uh, here we, we talked already uh, about uh, uh, how the uh, whole genome sequencing can give you like a real uh, burst in terms of understanding the epidemiology. So you have just two papers of 2017 uh, published in, in July and also in July and in January about uh, um, multi-country outbreak of Salmonella enteritidis. This is something that has happened in Europe, uh, looking at the um, distribution of Salmonella strains that have been well responsible for outbreaks both in England but also in Spain. So you have also that, like a transnational uh, migration, let's say, of these microorganisms. And then the other one is again related to Salmonella and in, uh, in, in Australia. So this, I think, that is something clear to everybody, being able to look in into uh, the genome of the different microorganisms, we can really understand how uh, they are related to each other, if there is a, a, the same strain that is responsible for the outbreak in different countries. So we have a very good tool that is for sure much more, um, let's say, deep in terms of the knowledge that you can get uh, compared to what we were used to, um, to exploit in the, in the past. Related to understanding of reservoirs, again, uh, there are a number of papers that they start already to take into consideration this aspect. Here there are two examples. We talked a lot uh, already these two days about the, the, the ice cream case here in the United States. But then you have also cases of tracking uh, pathogenic microorganisms in uh, plants. So uh, in, the, in the study on the bottom, practically what they did was to use whole genome sequencing to understand how the pathogenic strains of Listeria monocytogenes in particular were uh, detected in the different parts of the plant, and they, also, they were also able to understand a little bit how they were moving and what was the cause for them to move. But one of the, the aspects that I want to, to underline, and uh, let me spend a couple of minutes on that, is a kind of uh, translation of what has been done in this study that was produced by the, by the group of David Mills in, in California, where by using uh, modern technologies, and here we are not talking about whole genome sequencing, but the outcomes can really be translated to whole genome sequencing, sequencing when we talk about uh, football pathogens, is actually taking a very detailed picture of what is going on in your plant. 
So here, what they did was to apply um, 16S high throughput sequencing for a brewery plant. Uh, this is a nice representation of, of, of the plant with the different, uh, with the different uh, sectors, the fermentation, bottling, and everything else. And what they have done was to take samples from each part of the plant and create these kind of heat maps where you can really understand how contamination occurs. So here you can see practically the source. So these are grains, hops, and hops and yeasts. And the darker the color, the higher the uh, the presence with the specific the, sp the specific microorganisms. So. You can see how the, uh, the the contamination is changing in the in the plant. You can see also how it's changing in the um, uh, during during the year in the different in the different seasons. And uh, here is the last example of the human skin, for instance. So how human is actually a is uh, contributing to the microbiota of the plant. And so think about how this can be implemented for the football pathogens, uh, let's say, distribution. So you can take samples, you can uh, get your uh, pathogen if it is present out of the sample, you can do whole genome sequencing, actually you can track those microorganisms in your plant. And this, of course, it is very, very important because you will get an information on how the pathogen gets into your plant, and then, of course, you can do control measures in order to avoid this to happen. The last point is the contribution to risk assessment. So uh, here we are talking about uh, risk assessments. I'm not a risk assessor, so I'm a food microbiologist. I'm, let's say, a I, like, a, like an ecologist or microbial ecologist. So I'm a little bit, you know, out of uh, context. Or in any case, I'm not an expert on that. But I think that in any case, we need to think multidisciplinary. So the future is going to be the integration of the different disciplines in order to, um, to face or to, to the challenge, you know, of what we are talking about. About. So this is a nice example on how whole genome sequencing can actually give you an insight in terms of uh, hazard identification. So in this paper, the a group from, uh, from Netherlands, what they have done was to do whole genome sequencing of a number of uh, um, enterohemorrhagic E. coli. So by looking at the sequencing data, pure sequencing data, they really confirmed the genetic lineages. So uh, going into the DNA sequence, they could identify populations, and they could identify, or they could connect, let's say, the, the populations with the genetic lineages. This was not enough, of course, because if we, talk, if, if we, if we look into the difference at the, the genetic level, uh, you stop there. You don't know how the microorganism is actually behaving or how the microorganism can actually be uh, potentially pathogenic. So what they did was to do in vitro studies to uh, understand the uh, adhesion and the invasion, and they correlate the genomic data with the physiological data. And so they came out with these rather impressive uh, graphs where every single line represents SNPs present in the, in the genomes of the, of the microorganisms. In the first graph on your, right, on your uh, left, you have practically the result of the SNPs without taking into consideration the um, uh, without the correction, sorry, of the population structure. And in this, in, in this case, practically, you have an overestimation of potential significant SNPs that can make a difference between, or that could, re, could be related with the difference in the physiological uh, manifestation, let's say, of the pathogenicity. And in the other case, they took into consideration also the correction of the, of the, of the population structure. So taking into consideration consideration genomic data and physiological data. And as you can see, only one SNP could be considered as relevant to uh, explain the differences at the physiological data. So this was proposed to be a good potential biomarker. So in a population of different strains of enterohemorrhagic E. coli, you could really, really just focus or, let's say, focus uh, at least on this biomarker to understand also the potential that this, this, this strain can have at pathogenic level. But now I want to 
jump a little bit and I want to take you somehow in the future. So uh, let's get on board of, 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 of uh, the, 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 the machine of the, uh, the, 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 uh, of, of the future, let's say, of, uh, of, of, of the movie, you know, and just try to address it or to approach this, uh, this subject in a different way. We have genetic data. As I, could, as I told you, we don't know if we stop at genetic led data, we don't know anything about the behavior of the microorganism. So if we want to understand, or if we want to have an insight on how the microorganism is actually uh, behaving in a specific environment, necessarily you have to go to, uh, to other indices of activity. One can be uh, proteins, of course, the other one can be RNA. So I believe that one of the pioneering studies make, taking into consideration and demonstrating how microorganisms, and here specifically you, you were talking about Listeria monocytogenes, is actually reacting to a specific environment, was the, the paper published by, uh, um, by uh, Kosar in, in, uh, at the beginning of the two, 2000s, related to Listeria monocytogenes. So if Listeria monocytogenes is present in different environments, it actually expresses different genes, and is moving its transcriptome based on the inputs coming from the environment. So here you have, different, you have different cases, you have growth at 30 degrees, stationary phase, hypoxia, cultivation in blood, cultivation in, uh, in, uh, in the intestinal environment, and so as you can see practically the number of the genes are really, really different based on the, um, on the environment. And if we categorize a little bit the number of genes, here it's going to be practically impossible for you to see, but just let me highlight how the number of the genes that are related with pathogenicity, and so virulence markers are actually going up or going down based on the environment that Listeria monocytogenes is finding. So as the title says, practically Listeria can be considered or can act as a saprophyte or as a, as, a, as a pathogen based also on the environment. And so think about how those results can be actually translated when we are talking about food microbiology and our foods that contains this kind of microorganism. This is something that we have tried somehow to, uh, to address. Uh, this is a paper that we have prepared some, some years ago in a big European project that uh, was addressing the, the control strategies for pathogenic microorganisms in food. And practically what we have proposed is that, uh, like a, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a flow, we have to understand a little bit better what is going on inside of our cells in terms of uh, genomic, but also transcriptomic and proteomic data. We need to integrate those data with uh, uh, bioinformatics, bioinformatics and also chemiometrics. It is extremely important to have phenotypic data because this is really a critical point. I mean, yesterday we, I attended some sessions where they were saying we have this huge amount of data already available by the, genomes, by the genome sequencing point of view. So how are we going to exploit them? Well, if we don't have any kind of phenotypic data, it is going to be very, very, very hard to exploit them. We can exploit them by the point of view, as I was telling you before, because we can do source tracking, we can do surveillance much better. However, how we can integrate or how we can use them for risk assessment, then I see it a little bit more difficult. And so, as you can see, he, as you can see then, there is practically the last part that is related to interpretation of the data, new hypotheses that are going to be made, and of course we have to validate the, uh, the, 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 the experiment. So, taking into consideration these aspects, one more point that I want to contribute with is how important is the food matrix? Most of the data that at least have been generated in the last, I would say, uh, 15, 20 years, have been um, related to in vitro laboratory conditions. So very few experiments have been done in real food matrices. And if you remember what I was telling you about the Listeria paper, 
there is a huge influence of the environment on the physiology and on the gene expression of the pathogenic microorganisms. So what we have done here in this study was just a very simple experiment, like a proof, a proof of principle in which we took three different strains of Listeria monocytogenes. We simulated a uh, food matrix. This was just, I mean, you can see meat juices. So it was just an homogenate of uh, meat and an homogenate of uh, fermented sausage. And we inoculated these strains in different conditions, four degrees and uh, for 30 minutes and 48 hours. Uh, we looked at the expression with a, with a subarray. It was a microarray that was specifically designed again on the, on the European project that I told you before. But what I want to give you as a message, as a take home message, is that when we compared the actual gene expression of this set of genes that were all related to virulence, to adhesion, to stress response, we could actually see an overexpression of those genes in food systems compared to the in vitro laboratory conditions. So the expression, the expression of the genes were normalized towards the growth on BHI, 37 degrees, and you can see that most of the genes, at least there is a huge amount on top and also on the bottom, are actually high, highly expressed, hyperregulated. So there is, a, 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 there is a problem somehow, or there is let, let, let me not just call it problem, but we need to take into consideration that doing things in the laboratory conditions and doing things in, in, in the real world are actually completely different and can give you completely different things. We have tried somehow to integrate or to do some kind of integration related to uh, expression data and, and risk assessment. So what we have done was to actually look uh, at the expression of Listeria monocytogenes in two different sausages. Uh, one, the cacciatore, is the um, uh, fast acidifying tree. Eh? Wow, it's, it's a little bit different <laughs> from my count, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so is a, a fast acidifying, the felino is a, is a slow acidifying. So we looked for the, I'm going to go fast. I, I, we looked for the expression of different genes by uh, quantitative PCR, and then we could see, you know, a kind of differences in the, in the expression. Several genes were differentially expressed, but then when we integrated the data of gene expression with the physiological data and actually with the, uh, um, uh, with the, 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 the quantification of the persistence of these uh, strains in fermented sausages, we could actually create these nice maps in which we could identify genes that were very closely related to inactivation. So in this case, as I said uh, before, we could really identify biomarkers that could be used as uh, signals for inactivation of the microorganism. This is what I wanted to, I was uh, discussed, I, I discussed about. Uh, so last year, what we have done in collaboration with the ILSI in Europe, IAF and the ACFMH, we organized a workshop related to the next generation MRA. Um, we had four groups. Yesterday, as some of you attended, we had already a symposium on, uh, on, on these things. I just want to give you like a fast overview of what, uh, what we have done, because when we take into consideration sequencing, uh, sequencing is a lot of stuff. And so uh, when we take whole genome sequencing, whole genome sequencing is just a very tiny part of the next generation sequencing scenario. So we need to be aware that there are a lot of potentials of these methodologies. And of course, we need to start to think how these potentials can be exploited. Uh, those are the possibilities, in my opinion. Of course, this is the result of a paper that uh, we have produced from the working group of the metagenetics, of metagenomics, sorry. And what it is, in my opinion, most important is actually the part down here. So from metagenomic analysis, you can actually reconstruct whole genome sequencing. So at some point, we will not need anymore to isolate our football pathogens from the samples, because if the sequencing is deep enough, we will be able to get whole genomes from the metagenomes. And so this is a kind of a direct whole genome sequencing without cultivation, and we know we never touched this, uh, this issue yet in this symposium, but you know how hard it is 
to actually cultivate football pathogens. And you know how many biases are related to the, to the cultivation. Uh, and of course, from whole genome sequencing, we can go to prediction, we can go to genome scale metabolic models, and this is going to, to be impacting, in my personal opinion, the way we will do microbiological risk assessments. So this is just a very, uh, like, a, like a, a snapshot of uh, what we have done. Again, this is going to be probably creating much more questions or doubts than giving you answers. But so we have looked into the, this is a, a metagenomic shotgun library. This is ecology, nothing new. Those here are fermented sausages without the addition of starter cultures. These are sausages with the starter culture. So it is obvious that when we add the starter culture, we see only lactobacillus and we see only staphylococcus, while in the other case, we see a lot of other microorganisms. We can create these nice networks taking into consideration the activities. So here you have the metabolites of carbohydrate, amino acids and lipids in the spontaneous and inoculated. But what is more interesting, in my opinion, how this can be related to food safety and quantitative the microbiological risk assessment. So what we have done was to look for sequences of pathogenic microorganisms. We found Listeria monocytogenes sequences. Uh, very important to underline, those are sequences that the total sequences, so total microbiota sequences, you can see that we can go up to 70,000 sequences related to the, to, the, to the ecology of the system. And here you have the Listeria monocytogenes sequences. So you have like a tiny, tiny, tiny part of the sequences that are actually, you know, in this uh, overall sea of sequences uh, related to the other microorganisms. So looking a little bit more better into Listeria monocytogenes, you can see that practically there are a lot of genes related to metabolism, to the genetic information and processes. And uh, what is more important is that then if we go further in the second level characterization and even more into virulence factors. We find some sequences, but you can see that there are just a very few. So we have five sequences, for instance, of the invasion-associated secreted endopeptidase, for instance. Uh, we have uh, some sequences, nothing for the, uh, for the phospho phosphodetil, the, the, the phospholipase, for instance. So how do we address and how we interpret these results? I don't know. I don't know. So uh, again, we are technologically ready. We have the pipelines and the bioinformatic tools in place. However, probably we are not ready yet by the point of view of the understanding and the exploiting of the results that we get. So uh, there is some work that we need to do. Mm -hmm. So just the last, just the last uh, input that I, I want to give you, we are working in a complex ecosystems. So we need to take into consideration these aspects. And in my opinion, it is very important that we need to take into consideration the whole picture. It's not like in the, in the, in the performances you know, of our kids at Christmas, uh, that uh, every single partner is looking at his kid and is taking pictures or movies of the kid. We need to have a picture of the world system because only in this way we will be able to understand. So just to get the, to the last slide, the question was how will genome sequencing or better next generation sequencing is actually impacting uh, assessment of risk and setting of standards? For the first questions, I'm rather positive. I mean, we have the potentials. Of course, we need investments, because the problem that we have right now is that we don't have much money to run these experiments. Of course, we have a lot of different obstacles that need to be uh, overcome in the future. How they will set standards, I think that this is going to give us a lot of headaches yet, still. So uh, I'm not positive, and I'm really, convinced that this should not, at this moment, influence the setting of the standards. Listeria monocytogen is a pathogenic microorganism. We cannot allow ourselves still to consider, or uh, let me put it better, we, are not, we cannot consider different strains within the same species. So we still need to consider Listeria monocytogen as a single pathogenic species until when we will have a better background in order to fully address this problem. And for that, I just want to, uh, to, to 
acknowledge the people that has worked uh, with us uh, from the Dizafa, from the, the, the Nagraf, here it is, Marius Mataragas is a little bit hidden, but he is the one that did a lot of uh, these uh, risk assessment things, and of course all the people that uh, uh, have funded our research so far. Thank you very much.